Very good. Thank you very much. What's that uh, verse that Martin Luther wrote in his Christmas carol? Uh, From heaven above to earth I come. Pray with me. Ah, dearest Jesus, holy child, make thee a bed soft undefiled within my heart that it may be a quiet chamber kept for thee. Amen. It's childlike, isn't it? That's childlike. That's one, that's one quality that the scripture holds out because we all go from infancy through childhood, even teenagers. Boy, that's a rough time. Not for you, for them. Okay? And then adulthood. You can't remain a child forever, but you can remain childlike. Childlike. And so my little meditation this morning is not so much a sermon as a survey. I call it a child for children, a brief survey. Oh, the title is way too long. A brief biblical survey of child, of children, childlikeness, and its implications. So let's get started. I got it in three parts. Old Testament, Old Testament, right after creation, uh, after the Lord created everything, uh, including human beings, right after he finished with human beings, the last thing he said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So God loves people enough that they should procreate. They should have children. He loves, he loves human beings. He wants children. He wants families to have children and the world to be full of human beings, children. We all started out that way. Your parents listen, uh, your parents knew the mind of God, that, that uh, he wants the world to keep spinning and the world to, um, to be full of people. There are some countries that penalize you if you have too many children. I'm thinking of China. They just lifted that. They had a, a government law which says you could only have one child. And just two, three, four months ago, they changed that. You know, you can have two. There are some countries um, which are underpopulated. I did a little research on this. Guess what the most underpopulated country in the world is? There are 196 countries in the world, give or take a few. Some, you know, 196. Guess which country is the least populated? Right, Greenland. Greenland. It has so few people that my hunch is the government probably pays parents to have children, to have children. So, but we're talking about a biblical survey. A biblical survey is God loves children. He wants them around. He wants the world to keep going. He wants parents to have, he wants couples to have, to have children. So, on the flip side of that is barrenness was seen as a, as a, almost a curse. It certainly was a burden, but as a curse in the Old Testament. The first uh, one I can think of was uh, when the angel of the Lord came to Abraham and said, you, Abraham, uh, older than Tom here, Abraham was, and uh, you're going to have a child. And his wife, Sarah, she was almost 90 or 100, and he said, you're going to have a baby. And they, um, they wanted a child. They wanted a child so bad. And so when they heard that, I think it was mixed feelings. It's like, yeah, right, but wouldn't it be wonderful if it was true? And Sarah actually laughed because she didn't believe in the promise. But God is God, and he keeps his promises, and he can do all things. With God, nothing is impossible. And sure enough, they uh, had a baby. The barrenness was gone. Sarah was so cynical that she said, Here, here's Hagar, my handmaid. Uh, Pop, God's not going to do this. You you make a baby through my handmaid. And they did. As soon as Ishmael got on the scene, voila. Sarah was with child. And uh, that, that barrenness isn't just uh, one person. Uh, it was Abraham's grandson, Jacob, who had two wives, Leah. Leah had a passel of children, and Rachel, his favorite. Good reason not to have more than one wife. <laughs> you can't have favorites. Okay, and Rachel was barren, and, and uh, Leah had a, a passel of kids, and here Rachel had none. And finally, that burden was lifted. She had two children. She actually died in childbirth. I forgot that. When she had her second and last son, she gave. She died in childbirth. Now, there's a Christ image, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Rachel, uh, Rachel dies to bring her son life. Who dies to bring you life? The Lord Jesus on the cross. 
Lord Jesus. And then the, the most famous one about this problem of barrenness, I think famous, well-known, is Hannah. Remember Hannah? And Hannah was married to, um, oh, I looked this up last night. Uh, it starts with a knee. That's not important, but uh, help me out. Who? Elkanah. Elkanah, yeah. She should be the preacher, my wife. She, okay. Elkanah, and uh, she was barren. And Elkanah had another wife. Her name was Panina, and uh, she had children, and she rubbed it in. Nah, 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 Hannah, I have kids and you don't, making her life doubly bitter, triply bitter. And Hannah wanted children so bad, she prayed and prayed and prayed. She prayed so hard one time in the temple that the priests were sure she was drunk. Sure she was drunk. She was praying so fervently. God finally answered her prayer and lifted that problem of barrenness. So if barrenness was a problem, you can see that children were much valued by God's people in the Old Testament. In fact, Psalm 127, verses 3 or 4, somewhere in this, I love this little Bible, this little proverb. It says, you ever do archery? You ever do archery? Have you ever done archery in school? What is archery? Huh? What do you need when you're an archer? What do you need? A bow and an arrow. Okay, so this psalm in there says, children are like arrows. And happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. What's a quiver? Yes! Yes! You are a smart guy for a 10-year-old. Very good. Children are like arrows, and happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. What a blessing. Okay, let's see what else the Old Testament has to say. Kind of went through the patriarchs. I think it's interesting, noteworthy, <clears throat> that when the flood came, only eight people were saved, and the, there were four couples in there. Noah and his wife passed childbearing years, but the other three couples, his, their son, and their wives. I think that was intentional, so that when the uh, flood had done its... its destructive business on sinners hmm? on sinners uh, God allowed life to continue through those th three or four families this is a real important one I need to um, read to you from Deuteronomy after God called his people and delivered them from Egypt in the Exodus he gave them the Ten Commandments and some uh, other things and he said never forget these commands that I am giving you today teach them to your children so God's ways are not just for us grown-ups they're to be passed on to children while they're children what a blessing these children are brought to this church these young people by their parents so they can learn not just the thou shalt and thou shalt not. It's not just the Lord's Prayer, not just the Apostles' Creed, but above all that that baby in the manger died for their sins. Teach them to your children. Repeat them when you are at home and when you are away. Gary's translation is repeat them when you are at home and when you're driving in the car. You get, you get bored when you're in the car? You don't? Well, you're exceptional. I used to get bored in the car. And I think our kids, one of Peter's here today. We do have children. You sound like, he keeps saying you have two sons. Peter, our son, is here. Did you get bored in the car? There you go. <laughs> so we would do things, and one thing you could do is teach them God's ways, all right? And teach them when you are resting and when you are working. Tie them on your arms and wear them on your foreheads as a reminder. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Do that for yourselves and for your children. In Exodus chapter 22, we're introduced early about three classes, three categories of people that need special attention by God's people. Aliens, foreigners, and I could say something that's very contemporary right now about what Christians' attitude should be on aliens, but I, but I won't, it, but it says, be hospitable to aliens. Help the widows and the orphans. Orphans make up one-third of these special categories where God's people should go out of their way. All right? 
they all are needy in a way. Aliens don't have a country, widows don't have their husbands, and orphans don't have their parents. So that falls upon us. God puts that upon us. And then, of course, <clears throat> the, the, the child of child, children, the child of children would be from David's line. The descendant of David would be a child, and he would ascend the throne of David and rule forever, king of kings and lord of lords. So I go back to Ruth and Naomi. Remember that story? Ruth and Naomi. Naomi thought her life was over. They moved back to, to um, Bethlehem. Ruth, Ruth falls in love with Boaz. They get married. They have Obed. Naomi holds in her arms Obed. She thought she was going to not have any legacy, any descendants. Not only did she have Obed, but Obed had Jesse, and Jesse had David, and David became a king. But the king of kings was from the line of David, Luke chapter 2, unto the house, uh, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. So our survey there in the Old Testament. Now we're going to go to Jesus. This is important. What was Jesus' attitude about children? And immediately what pops into your head was that sunny afternoon in first century ba Palestine, when Jesus was busy uh, preaching and who was in the audience? Moms, bringing their children and infants, babies to the Lord Jesus. And who got in the way? His disciples. Sound like you and me, get in the way? Hmm? Get in the way? We flirt and cozy up to adults because they have money, they have position, they have power, they can do something for us, but we don't cozy up to children because they don't have anything. All they can do is tie their shoes and go to school, which is a lot. So we, we shush them away. And Jesus was indignant. And he said, stop it. Do we need to hear that here at Grace Church? Do we Lutherans need to hear it? Do pastors need to hear it? You betcha. Stop it. Let the little children come unto me and do not stop them. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he put his hands upon them and cradled them in his arms. And he blessed them. He blessed them. He loves children. Other than the fact he just loves children is children can believe. Children can believe. And children can witness Children can witness. After Jesus entered in Jerusalem and his final week on, his final week before his death by crucifixion, little children, they're the ones that sing Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. It's in the Bible. They sang in the temple. Not the adults, not the choir, not the clergy, the children. They can believe, they do believe, and they can witness so Jesus really values. I'm so glad to see um, you serving in, in the church. Acolyte, uh, it, your presence here, it's not a hard job, but your presence here to do that and playing the instruments and singing is very, very important. And uh, not only loving children, Jesus says certain things which leads us to believe that we should cultivate childlikeness. Childlikeness. He would say, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Hmm? He said that to Nicodemus. He said, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Okay, he didn't mean physically. There's no way I can reverse reverse who I am physically, but I can reverse who I am spiritually and become childlike. And what is childlikeness? What do, uh, what do we as adults do that we've abandoned when we were kids? Well, I think we fight an awful lot. Stop, we've got to stop that. I think we worry an awful lot. Kids don't worry. Hmm? And they take God at his word. I was told right before the service, we'll pray for that family that family of someone uh, important to one of our own who passed away. And adults, when someone passed away, we wring our hands and we cry and stuff like this. And a little child come up to him and say, I said, don't worry, 
Grandma's in heaven. It's exactly true. But we have all kinds of concerns and we cloud and muddy everything with our worries and, and things like that. Childlikeness, that's very important. And children come in. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to the third and final section of my elaborate, well-researched survey. Should make a book out of this, you think? Hardly. Okay, and that's the early church. When Jesus left on the uh, Mount of Ascension, 10 days later, the church was born. By the way, what were the last words of Jesus as a human being on this earth? I'll tell you what they were. All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even in the earth. There's a child in there. There's children in there. He says to the 12 uh, apostles, 11, they added, the, they, they got the 12th one a little bit later. Where's the children? All nations. There is not a country among these 196 countries in the modern world that doesn't have children. Whether you're China and you have two billion, or you're Greenland and you have whatever they have, tiny amount, there are children. So Jesus' last words talk about children. He says to the early church, of which we are descendants, hmm, don't forget the children. In Acts 16, when Paul and Silas were preaching, they upset the locals so much that they were arrested. Uh, their clothes were taken off. They were beaten. Uh, what's the word it says? Strongly beaten. They really suffered. Okay. And then there was a turned over to the jailer, and the jailer put him in an inner cell, a cell with inner cell, and put him in uh, blocks. Okay. And at midnight, um, um, there was a mighty earthquake. And somewhere around there, they were singing. Paul and Silas were singing. And then there was an earthquake. And the jailer, <coughs> and the jailer says, "Oh, I'm done." He assumed that everybody had escaped, and he got out a sword and he was going to commit suicide. And Paul says, "Stop! We're here! Can't you hear us singing? Can't you hear us singing?" And that event changed this sailor, uh, this jailer's life. And he asked about what they were preaching, and he came to faith that night. The jailer did, and who was baptized? Dad, the jailer, and mom, Mrs. Jailer, and all the family, the kids, the kids, children are included in the church's ministry. Which leads me to a little um, addendum. Gentlemen, we're responsible for our families. We are responsible for our families. It's us guys that should say, Come on, sweetheart, let's get the kids ready and get them in the car and go to church. Hmm? Not the other way around. No, sweetheart doesn't drag you, dad, to church. Drag's not a good word, but you know what I'm saying. Huh? It's dad takes the lead. And since the church is a family, us guys, we take the lead. We take the lead in um, overseeing and outreach and things like that. So what are the implications? I think they've kind of uh, served us as we were talking, as we were talking. If in the Old Testament children are not forgotten, indeed should be taught early, we, the New Testament people of God, should do no less. Even though our Sunday school is two or three, we don't abandon it. We could have done that this year. These ladies could have said, we're not doing a children's program. I mean, it's a small, we're not just doing it. It's just, there's not enough of us. No, you don't, don't do that. We don't do that. We're like the Old Testament. We teach our kids while at home and when in the car, so to speak. Another implication is of Jesus, if Jesus affirms children, so do we. If Jesus says, let the little children come unto me, and, uh, and then the... Um, and child, okay, child likeness, child likeness. Jesus says, there was, there was not too many years ago this kind of therapy which was called healing the child within. 
and it was a legitimate therapy. People who had been scarred as children were supposed to go back and heal the child within. I think we need to do that. Hmm. All this worry business and, and, and things like that and, and harshness and trying to, uh, she's gone to heaven. Where's our childlike faith? And then, um, once again, implication as a church. I'm not going to say the Christian church. I'm going to say Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church. We nurture children. We reach out to young families. We could be a custodial church. There's enough here. There's enough here to take care of the frail and the elderly. But Jesus says, do that and hmm, reach out to the young. God granted for Jesus' sake. Amen. Having heard the word of God.